An international rules-based order forged out of the ashes of World War II constitutes a global architecture that is ardently championed, albeit in conformity with strategic interests by the United States and its intercontinental allies, including most notably here in Europe. It sought to realize an adapted interpretation of the English School of International Society doctrine expressly defined by Hugo Grotius to develop one society of states governed not by force or warfare, but by actual laws and mutual agreement to enforce those laws. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Hassan and this is TV7 Europa Stance. As part of today's discussion, we will aim to dissect the latest developments pertaining to Europe's long and ever-growing list of challenges within the context of multilateral decision-making, and to do so, we're joined by General Klaus Naumann, who is the former Chief of General Staff of the Bundeswehr, as well as Chairman of NATO's Military Committee. Also joining us is Dr. Rafael Bardají, who is the CEO of Worldwide Strategy, who formerly served as Spanish National Security Advisor. Colonel Richard Kemp, a former British field commander and head of the International Counterterrorism Intelligence Team at the British Cabinet Office. And Mr. John O'Sullivan, who is president of the Danube Institute in Budapest, Hungary, and a former senior policy writer and speech writer of the late British Premier, Margaret Thatcher. Thank you all for joining us. And we'll start with you, General, uh, speaking about multilateral consensus versus individual holdout. Is Europe, and uh, for that matter, the West, within that context, playing in an even playing field with its strategic uh, rivals, China and Russia, at a time when the West predominantly favors the consensus among all nation states. And then we have, of course, at the other end, Russia and China, who rely exclusively on a, smoke, a small council. Well, I think we are in a, at a very critical juncture. Um, we learn day by day that our consensus-based order is not working properly in a crisis. In a crisis, the one who can take a decision quickly and without long consultation will always be in the, up, uh, in the upper hand. And that we see day by day. Uh, so we have to think through. Uh, this order was a fair weather order which has served us well during the past uh, 60 years of peace and prosperity. But now we came to an end and we have to think through what needs to be done. And one of the things which I think from a European point of view uh, has to be considered is whether unanimous vote is a proper instrument in a crisis or whether we should not embark on a majority vote, otherwise we will be incapable of acting in a crisis. Dr. Barahi. Well, I think the West was a construction almost a fiction, no, in the sense that the West has been always a group of countries led clearly by the United States. And when the United States failed to lead, the West faded away as an actor to deter or to roll back aggression. And we have seen that lately, unfortunately, in Ukraine. Uh, so we need to, to come back to some extent to the basics of what the West values were and uh, trying to change the dynamics in domestic policy that is a construction and a destruction of the, pre the predecessor. You know? We have uh, Barack Obama, Trump, Biden, and there is little movement forward of the, the real policies that uh, will, will try to unite the West as such as in the past for so many decades. You know? But it's a matter of fragmentation within the political dynamics of domestic nation, and particularly in my own view, the United States. Colonel Kemp? I don't think there's a problem with the, our mechanisms and our, our consensus politics and decision making. I think, I think the problem is much more fundamental than that. I, I think to echo slightly General Nauman's comment, I think this system we've got now worked better when there were no challenges to it, when, when we were living in a period of peace and prosperity, which has pretty much been the case since the Second World War. And now we're, we're finding that... that um, <coughs> the leadership just is not there. And it's a leadership that is far too influenced, I think, today by the media in a way that leadership historically has not been influenced and controlled to the extent it is by the media. So I think, I think the, the key issue is, is leadership. And also, again, to echo slightly what uh, Raphael said, the, um, a lack of maybe a lack of national 
self-belief, a lack of national self-confidence, which the Chinese and the Russians certainly don't have, but I think we do have. And we need to find that, and we need to find the leadership. In one word, patriotism. Mr. O'Sullivan? Um, I think that the system of uh, peace and prosperity undergirded by agreed rules of the game, um, those systems work well until they don't. And the first occasion really in which they didn't was 2008 when you had the invasion of, um, of Georgia by Russia. And at that moment, you could see, uh, just at the beginning, divisions between people in the West, in Europe uh, and America, and, and within Europe. And I thought myself, uh, there were people who for years had been saying, uh, we have to pay full attention to global, to, to law, international law. And yet, when that push came to shove, the Western Europeans were not really keen to enforce that rules. They were appealed to by Central Europeans to do so, the famous letter that went to Barack Obama, and effectively the decision was made, it costs too much to do so. And we reiterated that, in a sense, failure to decide in 2014 with the crisis over Crimea and Ukraine. And I'm afraid that the present situation is a case of chickens coming home to roost. Indeed. Well, uh, having you here also as uh, the former speechwriter of Margaret Thatcher, I'd like to quote her as uh, the one who said that to her, consensus seems to be the process of ab abandoning all beliefs, principles, values, and policies, so it is something in which no one believes and to which no one objects. Yes. General Nauman? Well, <laughs> difficult to object to that. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, but to what degree do you see? I, uh, I admire Mrs. Thatcher very much when I was, uh, I was, it was Paul Mill at the time when she had uh, from time to time her feather ruffling with Chancellor Kohl. Um, <laughs> yes. Interesting time, but uh, she turned out to be right in, mm. in this missile debate which we had then, follow on to Lance was the key uh, word. And uh, Kuhl, on the other hand, I think was right in grasping the opportunity which was offered by the uh, weaknesses of the Soviet Union. And he knew exactly that the oil which made the system work was money, which mm -hmm. was available at the time. And so he, uh, he took advantage of an opportunity, which at the end of the day led to German unification. So. It was a tremendous success. Indeed. Uh, and yet, uh, I'd like to challenge this by asking whether the necessity for consensus within Western society, does that derive out of lack of leadership? Within the Russian society? Western society. Western society. I think, yeah, to some extent. We have in Europe, I'm afraid to say that, we have no convincing leader at all. Um, no one of our politicians is such a convincing personality that he could attract uh, the consensus of the people. And we have no idea in Europe, we have no vision of Europe. What we see is a bureaucratic monster, I should say, called the European Union. But there is no idea which would make the people believe, yes, that's the idea for which I will fight, for which I will stand. Um, and as long as we do not have this, we will be condemned to be in the second row. We will be dominated by the two big powers, China and the United States. Dr. Bardaki? Well, I have a different definition from Lady Thatcher of what consensus is. No? <laughs> I may be wrong, but I think she said at some point that consensus is the policy of the weak. Mm. And uh, uh, in that sense, actually, I would go farther than that. I would say that consensus in Western Europe has been the tool used by the left when in the opposition to constrain the center-right governments. So I wouldn't be so focused and anguish about obtaining consensus because consensus can be produced by leadership or by the anti-leadership that they, they are preventing any decision-making process. So I wouldn't be fixated with the consensus as such. I prefer uh, following Richard's word, focus on leadership, able to move the public opinion in the right direction. And we haven't had 
in my, in my view, certainly in the UK and probably in the whole of Europe, we haven't really had a strong a conviction politician who is also a very, very strong leader like Mrs Thatcher. We haven't had anybody like that. I mean, Tony Blair, I think, had a good deal of leadership ability. Um, you know, obviously, his, his, particularly his domestic politics were very different. But, but you know, we, we, really have, we really lacked strong leadership since then. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, partly a product, as I mentioned before, of, of the media. And the, you know, the media almost requires and, and damns and uh, tries its best to finish off a politician who doesn't conform to their, their pre predominantly left-wing norms, certainly in the UK again. And as far as the, the EU is concerned, and General Nauman mentioned um, the EU, I think, I think the EU has been probably the biggest disaster that Europe's ever had because it, it has tried to undermine national, um, well, you mentioned the word patriotic spirit, it's, just, it's tried to undermine national individuality. I think, I think we're seeing that it doesn't actually work at all because you know, we're seeing in France and Germany and Italy and other countries, we're seeing one particular line which is probably closer to the Brussels line and then we're seeing in Central European, Eastern European countries a completely different perspective. So I think it, it does shatter the whole, the whole concept of the EU. Mr. O'Sullivan? Um, we, we don't know a leader is a leader until the leader demonstrates the fact. Um, Mrs. Thatcher wasn't always Mrs. Thatcher we knew. But of the two leaders we're probably thinking about, Ronald Reagan and Thatcher, both of them took the opportunity to demonstrate the toughness. I mean, Reagan actually welcomed clearly the air uh, traffic controllers strike, which he refused to, um, he fired everybody and refused to take them back. And I think everybody in international affairs took notice of this. This was a major domestic challenge to a new president. And he'd welcomed the chance to demonstrate his authority. Mrs. Thatcher, of course, did so later in the Falklands War, which effectively, because she had in a sense, both manoeuvred and marched to victory, shown both subtlety and um, bravery in what she did. Uh, she then was able to win an enormous number of battles at home. Um, but the, 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 what I therefore would say is, if an opportunity to demonstrate leadership appears and a leader doesn't take it, it tells you all you need to know, really. <laughs> Indeed. Uh with that being said, of course, we're looking at a, a reality in which there is a lack of leadership. We're all aware of that. You all have mentioned that. But uh, General Nauman, when we're looking at the opportunities, as Mr. O'Sullivan mentioned, we saw Schultz travel to Moscow. We saw uh, Macron travel to Moscow and, and uh, a long list of, of different individuals, none of whom convinced anyone that they were the ones to stand up to the Russian bear. Uh, where is this placing Europe? Is it right now at the mercy of Russia? And to bring in what Dr. Barahi just mentioned, in uh, the, the perpetual seeking of US leadership? I have a very different <coughs> view on this traveling to Moscow. Uh, from my perspective, uh, these various trips are nothing but a mistake since they uh, encourage Mr. Putin to continue his match as he wants to do it. He has a clear vision. He wants to do what, what he wants to achieve. He has told us what he wants to achieve. He wants to restore the Russian Empire. And uh, we should have no illusions about it. It's not about Ukraine. It's m about much more. And uh, it's a global match which is being played. And they're the only partner which Putin will ever listen to and will respect is the United States of America. The Europeans can cry crisis and wolf. It will not change anything at all. So if we want to achieve a result in this present crisis, the European leaders should consult with President Biden what to do next and should devise a strategy, a match plan, how to win. And then Biden has to talk to Putin. I think that's the only way forward. You can build as many tanks as you want without the manpower to man those. It's worthless. Well, in two weeks' time, we will have another summit of NATO at the top level with President Biden coming to Europe and all the rest of prime ministers from the allies' countries. 
uh, and uh, I would like to see some kind of common reaction to the current situation. Unfortunately, my fear is that we will have another very elegant strategic concept focused on 2040, but nothing between now and then. Uh, NATO is playing a, a kind of uh, a strategic fading game uh, since the second week of the war in, 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 in Ukraine. No? But it, it could be the best option to really present a common ground, a common position vis-a-vis -vis Putin. Whether the leaders are up to the task is an open question. We'll see. By my, from my own experience, I'm rather pessimistic. Colonel Camp. I think um, General Nauman mentioned the, um, that uh, you know, we, we need American leadership. With, America is the only country that Putin will listen to, but unfortunately we don't have American leadership. It's not there. Mm -hmm. And I think the current situation that we face in Ukraine results from a failure of American leadership. It directly stems, I think, from the, the timing at least, stems directly from President Biden's unwise decision to pull out of Afghanistan precipitately. Uh, and so, I, you know, the, the, that, that is the reality. And, and, and I think while he is the president of the United States, we can't expect to see the kind of leadership we need. Yet Europe is, is really crying out for it. I think recent polling shows in many countries, and I think most strongly in Central and Eastern European countries, how important American leadership is to them uh, because they're not getting it from within, within Europe. Mm. Mr. O'Sullivan? Well, it's very unfashionable to say this, but um, it isn't the case that the European Union has produced uh, peace in Europe. It is the case that the European Union is the beneficiary of peace in Europe that was established by the fact that America was a European power in an almost full sense after 1945 and brought NATO into being. Now, I've always been a skeptic about the idea of a specific European separate defense identity uh, because I thought it would either divert resources from NATO or duplicate them. And I, don't, I never really wanted that. But if we're going to have that, it's plain that it's got to be, in a sense, an attached subordinate to NATO. And that's something which um, we've been moving in the wrong direction ever since Tony Blair, by the way, persuaded uh, George Bush to accept this. And I would like to see it clearly established, even by a not very impressive President Biden, that America is fully committed in the long term to uh, NATO and to a European presence. General, I think, I think the, 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 the opposite is, is the desire of people like President Macron, who, who wants to show, he wants to lead Europe. He wants to, he's been, I think, the greatest impetus behind this flawed idea of a European defence union of some sort, and therefore it, he he would. Str I agree with what John said, but he would strongly, I think, resist that. You wanted also to. Read. Yeah, um, I do not quite agree with this Biden bashing, which I just heard from our two British friends. Uh, admitted, President Biden is not the the convincing leader one might expect, but he is uh, an image of his society, which is deeply so divided. And he, can, he cannot get the American nation back on the track of, uh, let's say, the 40s and the 50s. Um, there we are. We have to live with that. And we have, I think we Europeans have, first of all, tried to get our acts together, since there will be situations in which Euro the Americans will not be prepared to act, but Europe's security will be concerned. And then we Europeans have to do something. We should not wait for the big brother. And, and secondly, the Americans need to understand that they are playing with their global power. If they don't have Europe on their side, they will no longer be a global power, but only a regional power. That's the old rule of maritime uh, strategy. If you are not in control of both opposing coastlines, you are lost. And the United States of America understand that. Indeed. Mr. O'Sullivan? Well, I, I want to uh, come back because you make a fair point when you said that Biden represents the divided America. Um, and uh, I think he's done slightly better than I would have expected in the Ukraine Agreed. crisis so far. But um, 
unfortunately, in the domestic crisis in America, he's almost on the wrong side of it. He's encouraging uh, the, in, the Democratic Party is now more or less devoted to um, a series of attitudes and politics which are really uh, very difficult to reconcile uh, with an outward-looking, strong American exercise of force and, dipl and diplomatic leadership. Uh, that has to change uh, if things are to work well. I don't see it changing, uh, well, partly because of his human weaknesses in, in the next two years. Of course, everybody wants to get their house in order or should get their house in order before they can become a leader of any sort, especially in a, ter a tumultuous uh, uh, state uh, in which the world finds itself today. But General Nauman earlier referred to Peter the First speech by uh, President uh, Putin, uh, a speech in which uh, Putin, and, and if I may uh, quote him, uh, what was Peter I doing, uh, Putin said uh, uh, roughly a couple of weeks ago, taking back and reinforcing, he said, that's what he did, and it looks like it fell onto us to take back and reinforce as well. Considering these very strong words, and this is not the first time that uh, uh, the Russian leader has stated this, seeing himself as the successor of Peter I or Peter the Great, however you may uh, refer to him, uh, that is the same Russian leader who also defeated the, the powerful uh, Swedish kingdom, which now fails to join into the multilateral organization called NATO. Mm. Wh what can we draw well, from this? Uh, uh I don't have any problem with the imperial or rec the, the desire to the reconstruction of Mother Russia by Putin. As far as it's clear, we understand where the limits are. The problem to me is that NATO was based on deterrence, and we have failed to deter uh, this dream of reconstructing Russia in the last five years. Uh, we are now very happy because we are acting in a tepid way in Ukraine. While we should also launch a reflection on why we failed in deterring Putin to move forward. That's the key issue. If we are going to stop him and roll back, we need to put a policy for doing so with the right means and the right goals. No? And we are not doing that, I think. Uh, and that's a real problem. Whether the Chinese have a global imperial uh, design as well, okay, fine. The borders has been always the, 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 the definition of different forces in, in, in presence. What we have to do is to preserve our tariff, preserve our goals, and preserve our do the, uh, domestic arena free of those influences and those threats. No? And this only can be done by deterrence or defense in an active way. No? Colonel Kemp? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree in wholeheartedly with that. But, uh, and I don't see any great prospect of these things that Rafael has said. For a lack of? For, for lack goes back to the same thing as I mentioned and other people mentioned before, a lack of leadership There's an, and a lack of self-confidence, lack of self-belief in all of our countries. So if we can't find all that, we, we are going to find ourselves succumbing to these competitors, as, as the EU like to call them. And I think China certainly looms large in the background. And we should be very concerned about, about uh, what China is reading from the very weak response of the West to Ukraine and in, rela in relation to their ambitions in Taiwan. And of course, we're seeing, we, we saw only, I think a week ago, we saw a, a new, a completely new reinvigorated relationship between Russia and China, which I think should worry us enormously. And yet, when, if, go ahead. If, if you were a citizen of Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, or even Israel, could you base your national security in the hope that the Americans will do the right thing after two years and elect a more vigorous president? Or would you put all, all your effort in, in producing yourself the capability that you need? No? That's the dynamic of fragmentation, which is currently in presence. No? Indeed, and of course, isolationism pays off until oil prices rise. General Nauman, I'd like to also hear your uh, point that you wanted to mention, but also beyond that, to what degree do you see uh, the, the European continent challenged to a certain degree its own perception that it should act as a secondary actor within this context of strategic power competition? Well, I, th I think, uh, first of all, Europe has to understand that it has but one chance, and that is to be on the side of the United States in this global conflict 
which is emerging and is a systemic conflict. It's not just a, quest a, a question of power. It's a question of the order of life in which we want to live. There's one system called democracy afterwards. The other one is autocracy. And there we have to take sides. For me, the question is crystal clear. We have to be on the side of democracy. And that doesn't work without the United States of America. And uh, Raphael mentioned earlier on the summit of Madrid. I think if the summit of Madrid takes serious what Putin has said, this Peter the Great idea, we have to take this as a fact and we have to seek a way in which we will offer Russia a possibility to be a respected partner in the world, but at the same time we have to tell the Russians in crystal clear words, if you want to pursue Peter the Great again, like Poltava, the battle or the, the peace of 1634, then you are heading for war. And if you want to have war, you get it. That, I think, has to be a crystal clear message. And uh, we could add to that, Russia, be aware, you will never win this war. And I think they're quite aware of that, Mr. O'Sullivan. I want to, I agree entirely uh, with what seems the general view that um, NATO is vital because it, it is the alliance and the, hopefully the permanent one of uh, Europe and the United States. The question is what policy is that alliance going to pursue? I ask this question particularly in relation to deterrence because what's happened so far in the Ukraine war has been that we have seem to have altered without any real discussion or thought, the doctrine of deterrence, which has been applied until now. Now, as I understand it, and I'm uh, no military background at all, we used to say, well, you can't attack a nuclear power. But we seem to have subtly altered that so that we now say in relation to Ukraine, you can't resist a nuclear power. And effectively, that is a huge change. Now, if it's really to, if that change has been accepted, it's that's, if that's what we think, then it seems to me that, that for the countries which are just joining NATO, for the Baltic states which are already in it, for Poland and for everybody else, we really have to build up their conventional forces in a major way because if a nuclear power, if they are attacked by a nuclear power, which is not out of the question, uh, even though Putin at the moment seems to be a bit nervous on this score, he's said he won't resist Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Um, nonetheless, um, the, we have to have the ability to resist Russia without an uh, early resort to nuclear weapons, or else think of something else. Colonel Kemp? I think the, the doctrine, the shift in the doctrine of deterrence is actually a very convenient excuse um, by NATO countries. Um, they, I, I don't think, personally, I, I don't think many people have the fear that Putin is going to go nuclear. I think it's highly unlikely, and I think most people would think that, but it is very convenient to to use the potential for that to happen as an excuse not to do anything, not to physically engage in the conflict. And mm -hmm. So I think it reflects, um, a, 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 it reflects the kind of, I would say, sickness within Europe and, and the US at the present as well that we've been discussing, the, the lack of leadership, the lack of self-belief, the lack of will. Um, and and, and I, I, I do believe, I, I think even if, for example, Putin attacks a NATO country, I think that that same excuse will be trotted out. So, for example, let's say he has a go at Lithuania over the Kaliningrad issue. I don't think he's likely to, but if he did, then I, I, would NATO come to the aid of a, of a fellow NATO country? I, I, I severely doubt it. Well, if it wouldn't, obviously China would be the next to act, General. Well, if, he, if I take your word serious, Richard, then NATO is a failure. And this is not a failure. It's our only and best assurance we have at this point in time. So should he dare to attack Lithuania, he will have war. And I think he, he must know it. And I would also object to the idea that you can't resist the nuclear power. If we had believed in that, we would have lost the Cold War. And uh, I think there are options to tell a nuclear power that there are certain limits. And we have, we have a lot of arrows in our quiver. 
And uh, if we follow that line, the nuclear power is more or less in irresistible. That's an invitation to all the other countries to, to become a nuclear power. Many countries in this world could do it easily. Uh, for my country, it would be a matter of a couple of weeks. But we have renounced of nuclear power because we rely on the nu nuclear guarantee by the United States and the other nuclear powers in NATO. So we ha I, th I think we have to be very, very careful uh, in more or less extending an invitation to become nuclear. Dr. Barakhi? Well, well, I just complete. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one yeah. moment. We hold <laughs> that thought. Yeah. Dr. Well, Barakhi? Yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure about the ability of NATO to maintain the cohesion uh, in case of uh, imminent war with, with the Russians. No, I think uh, what we have seen during the Ukrainian crisis has been different domestic positions, including in Germany, that have undermined the strength of NATO as the common uh, uh, institution for deterring and guarantee of defense, actually, I think. So some countries will have some doubts. The, the way how, how do we strengthen NATO as a mechanism to guarantee to any of the members that we are serious and credible in our commitments? which is not clear to me now, not with the Americans, not with other countries. So the, 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 the national temptation is, is there. And second thing, uh, if we are going to fight the Russians, we better think out of the box. Uh, we better find uh, offensive uh, cyber capabilities uh, to damage the country in, in, in quicker ways. Because if we are going to fight tank by tank, tactical nuclear device by tactical device, at the end, we all will be dead, no? and, and, and that's a very deterrent uh, issue you know, that we have to bear in mind. No? In one sentence? But, then we'll but we should not confuse, Rafael, uh, that there is a difference between Ukraine and a small country like Lithuania. Lithuania is clearly protected by the NATO treaty. Yep. Lithuania was never uh, the but, same, uh, in the but, same situation as but, Ukraine is. Ukraine has no protection by anyone but Ukraine. Yes. Just to make assurance completely sure, um, I was not arguing that we, uh, I didn't agree with the idea that you can't resist a nuclear power. I simply said that seemed to be in the case of Ukraine, the kind of operational doctrine. I mean, we, we weren't, um, we were suggesting that there's nothing much we could do uh, uh, to resist uh, Russia if it decided to use nuclear weapons. You didn't get anybody really by str strongly fighting back against that argument. So I th I, that's why I would like to see the Madrid conference address the question of deterrence and make it plain and reestablish a doctrine which I think has got a bit moth-eaten around the edges. Colonel Kemp, we're sitting right now in Helsinki. Obviously, we expected uh, Finland and Sweden to join NATO a lot faster than uh, the current state uh, in which we find ourselves. Uh, is Turkey now playing a certain role in challenging, to a certain degree, the strategic security of, of the West at large, but Europe also in particular? I think um, President Erdogan has had, um, he, 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 he almost sees the West as, as his enemy, I think. Um, and, and, and therefore, I think that may play into an extent to the tactics he's using. What we don't really understand, I think, and certainly I don't, is whether he's simply playing this out in order to make demands himself or get some kind of agreements himself or some kind of advantage for Turkey out of it, and then he will eventually agree to it, or whether he has some other motive behind it, whether there is something between him and Putin that is uh, guiding his steps. So I, I think it's a, it's a very difficult thing to understand but I think it does go also to my concerns over NATO's willingness to, to act. NATO, NATO seems to me now to be pretty dysfunctional. It talks big, it, it, you know, some of its members deliver weapons, others don't. It's divided internally, not just with Turkey but you know, with France, Germany, UK, they have, there are very different policies on this. So I think NATO, you know, to, to me NATO looks, General Nauman used the word, NATO, I'm, I'm saying NATO is failing, I am saying NATO is failing. Dr. Barakhi, um, taking the whole Turkish equation into the picture, of course, the sister country of Turkey, Qatar, is becoming effectively the replacement of Russia when it comes to European 
reliance on natural gas. Uh, so to what degree the 155 BCMs or billion cubic meters of natural gas that have now uh, become a hole in European energy consumption, uh, to what degree is that now turning, of course, to a lesser degree also to the United States and, and also to uh, the MOU signed with Israel and Egypt, Qatar is becoming the biggest um, exporter now into the European continent. Uh, yes and no. I think uh, it's more talk than in reality. The, the major uh, exporter now to Europe is the United States. Uh, second is Algeria. And then Qatar will try to move the gas in a natural way with tankers and others, but it's not yet the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure to do so, but in the future it will, it will be. But we cannot go from one problematic country to another, which is probably more problematic, like Qatar, no? uh, in all the game with radicalism in the Middle East and have been playing lately uh, from the Levant to the Gulf. So I think we have to be ser very serious when we pick up our next allies. Uh, because we can we can put ourselves in a more volatile situation unless we are we realize where we're going. But um, the Ukraine conflict is is affecting everyone. I mean, North North Africa now is in turmoil again, just because of that, because the Russians are present in Algeria, the United States in Morocco, and uh, you know it's, it's 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 a much more complex picture than just focusing in Central Europe, no? and uh, that's something we have to bear in mind as well. No? General Naumann, uh, I'd like to hear also your comment on this, since Germany is going to be the biggest recipient, uh, including Spain, to a lesser degree, uh, of Qatar's uh, LNG, or uh, liquidite uh, natural gas. Is this uh, serving as a problem? Uh, it may help. Uh, Germany has to rethink its entire energy policy. It made a couple of tragic mistakes. The first one was to abandon nuclear energy. Uh, without having any replacement uh, at hand. Uh, then the irresponsible reliance on Russia. 55% of our gas import came from Russia, or co still come from Russia. That is something which is strategic nonsense. And uh, s some people in Germany understood this and warned the government. Many of our allies warned uh, the German government, but Mrs. Merkel, believed that, I think she, she believed uh, in the idea of change through trade, uh, which turned out to be a mistake. We, are, we have to think through how we can arrange for energy supply in the future. We, can, we have an option, a, a midterm option with renewable energy, uh, and we have to look for new sources of, of uh, import. But uh, we will find ways. We have always found ways when we were back at the wall, and we are at the wall right now. Mm. Mr. O'Sullivan? Oh, well, I completely agree with, uh, with, with that. I mean, there's um, the, key mo the key point, which, uh, General, you made earlier, actually, is that even from an American point of view, it badly needs in the long term to have Europe as an ally. If it's going to contend with an aggressive and rising China, it can't really allow um, the, the continent of Europe to become contested territory between Russia and itself. It's got to really have a secure uh, ally there. And that's something where uh, the Americans have got to, the American leaders have got to convince their own people because there is a mood in the United States that we're fed up with all of these uh, commitments abroad. We do have a fight with China, let's tilt to Asia. And I think that, that you, you have to deal with China, but you can't do so by surrendering Europe. Uh, Colonel Kemp, uh, there is a reason I wanted to do that uh, uh, answer in this form. But uh, I'd like to quote one of the famous Chinese generals, uh, Sun Tzu, uh, in his book, Art of War. Uh, he said, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. And of course, we can follow that up with uh, uh, another statement that he mentioned within that book, uh, which is, you also need to know when to fight and when not to fight. The Chinese seem to know exactly when not to fight and when to fight. Uh, they have been uh, engaging in a supreme excellence, if you will, uh, versus the West, since it is 
utilizing security provided by the West in order to expand and exploit that for its own keen interests in Beijing. Uh, how do you see this? Is this now something that, uh, again, are we in the same playing field with them or are we speaking a different language? I think that the Chinese have never, I mean, possibly with the exception of Sun Tzu, the Chinese have never been particularly skilled at strategy, uh, in my opinion. But actually, they've got a level play. They've got an open goal in many ways, because what they've, it's like, as General Nauman was saying, we, you know, uh, Angela Merkel thought that she could change Russia through trade. And we also, the Americans, the Europe, thought they could change China through trade. And of course, you know, China knew what the game was. We were, look, we were trying to, you know, we, we, we were kind of naively expecting that they would suddenly transform themselves by being allowed into the, into the global order. And, of course, that hasn't been the case. They've used, they've used um, you know, our weakness against us, and that's why they've, I think, become so strong. And although John says you know, we've got to do business with China, we have, but I think there is a, there's a growing need um, for us to really rethink the whole globalization issue. And, and you know the extent to which we can become so dependent on, the, on any country, whatever it is, unless we're absolutely certain that they're a rock solid ally. And going back to the energy issue, I see that the EU is now making nice with Israel because they want Israel's gas, which is, you know, they haven't necessarily been the, the greatest friends of Israel over recent years, but now they suddenly seem to try, be trying to become so. And that, that of course, is a rock solid ally. Indeed. Uh, I cannot disagree with that part. Dr. Bardakhi, I'd like to hear your angle to this, but I'd like also to challenge you. A invasion, Taiwan, imminent? Well, if I were a top brass from the Chinese army, I would think twice before engaging in any conflict or military special operation, mm -hmm. given that the, one of the most powerful armies in the world has failed miserably in con conquering Ukraine in a couple of weeks and is still fighting. Uh, so I, I don't think any military operation, and you have two representatives can speak better than me on that, is uh, evolving according to any plan. And all the difficulties and all the problems that you can encounter that will be there. So success and victory is not guarantee any military operation. So being prudent, I will have to think twice about the, the trying to get uh, or grab uh, Taiwan nowadays no, until we see how the warfare evolves. No? Uh, but I have another another point, even more uh, on on the whole conflict. You know, I think uh, the, if we look at this weak decision by the Fed in the United States and the central bank in Europe will rise the the interest rates. Uh, apparently, the, the the economic authority have decided that recession is better than inflation. So the economic situation coming in the coming year uh, will affect the pockets of many citizens. How that will affect the narrative in support of a conflict in Ukraine against Russia, when everyone, every leader in Europe is, is blaming the war for inflation, for the lack of whatever, you know, and, uh, uh, can we sustain p publicly uh, support for Ukrainian resistance in 12 months, in 15 months, in two years' time from now? Well, that's an open question we have to also I mean, consider. Inflation in America rose to 7% long before the invasion yeah. of Russia and Ukraine. General, I'd like to hear your uh, position on the Taiwan potential invasion, but also uh, what is the U.S. strategy vis-a-vis -vis such a potential? Well, I, uh, first I should say uh, China has one attitude which we Europeans and the Americans are lacking desperately. They have patience and they have a long-term vision. They will never give up the aspiration to include Taiwan into the Chinese motherland. But they have time. And they, they do not take risks. They are very different from Putin. They do not take the risk of a failure in which their military might be degraded or might, might fail. The time is not yet ripe for an invasion of Taiwan. Chinese once used military power offensively that was in Vietnam, and that turned out to be a failure. They have learned from that, so they will wait. And my second argument is the Chinese are very much interested in keeping one key element of Taiwan intact, and that is the semiconductor industry of Taiwan, which is the most developed in the world. Should a war destroy this industry, 
Chinese will, su will suffer badly from that. They will not do it. They want to get it intact. So the time is not yet there. For that reason, I think the Chinese have learned from the Russian bad military experience in Ukraine that it is better to prepare and to wait and to wait until the, the apple is ripe enough to fall into the Chinese hands. And that time has not yet come. Not to forget also that the West is heavily reliant on that industry in Taiwan, including the U.S. military. Yeah, but that is one of the, that's one of the reasons which is also applicable to Europe, that the Americans are not prepared to give up Taiwan. Uh, they need it economically, as they need, by the way, the trillions of investment, of American investment in Europe, which they also not, are not prepared to give up. And the other issue is a strategic one. If you look at the, it's a maritime, it's a maritime match. If you look at the forward defense line in maritime categories, then you have the first line of defense in order to protect the Pacific Indian Ocean from Japan via Taiwan to the Philippines. So Taiwan is a vital element in more or less controlling the Indian Pacific Ocean and to control the Straits of Malacca, which are so important for the world trade, since 44% of the world trade goes through the strait. If that were, were given up by the Americans, they would give up themselves. Sorry. On that uh, one issue, it's worth mentioning the, the new role of Japan in the area. I mean, the, the, the evolution of the defense forces, the budget, the new carrier, the assurance between Japan and Taiwan, which also put in doubt the commitment by the Americans. But I just want to just to well, that. Well, I think, yes, I was just about to make this point. Um, that in the last um, two or three years, we've seen the United States construct, uh, four or five years, um, construct a series of alliances, the latest of which is AUKUS, uh, bringing the Brits and the Australians into the game. Um, but you've also got the Quad, and you've got India, the relationship with India, which I think is a very important one. At the moment, people are pointing to the fact that India, along with a lot of other non-Western countries, has been holding itself aloof, even somewhat hostile, to, um, to the West in relation to Ukraine. But in the long term, India, it seems to me, has to be an ally of the United States, first of all, because its main conflict is going to be with China. And, the, and on, in that, for example, the Russians are not going to be the allies of India, um, and, and the West would be. And secondly, because there are so many links now with Indian diasporas in all parts of the major Western countries, that it's going to be much easier culturally to develop this kind of alliance. The one question I would ask everybody here is, the French were annoyed by what happened at AUKUS, and I can see why. They have their own interests there. How can, can, can somehow the French and NATO be drawn into a similar relationship um, in that part of the world, or, or should we just not bother? And the Indians, if I may say, they add to that, they are very shrewd and clever people, very intelligent people. They understand that Russia will emerge from that Ukraine adventure much weaker than it was before it began this adventure. And in the uh, competition with China, they will need the West, as you rightly said, and not so much a weak Russia. Colonel Camp? I'm, I may be the odd one out here, but I don't really look at this war in Ukraine in the same, through the same uh, eyes as, as the others on this panel, I, and, and most people in the world, actually. I, I don't see Russia as failing in Ukraine. It, it, maybe it could have done better, but I don't think I don't think the the way that the Russian campaign has been projected is realistic. I think the Russians attempted to bring down Ukraine without real fighting. They attempted to just do it just by invading, and that didn't succeed. And it's a classic Russian strategy or tactic to 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 try and achieve something. And if you don't do that, you then go to the next thing, and that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing. That you know that they are overcoming Ukraine in Donbass very very effectively. They have succeeded in in seizing a huge amount of the Ukrainian coastline and have ambitions and probably the intent to to continue right up uh, through Odessa and beyond. 
And, and I think this is, this is a, it's, it's not the disaster that for Russia, I don't think, that many people see it as. And I don't think Beijing sees it as that because Beijing is backing Russia now more than it was earlier on in the war. Um, and, and, you know, finally, I would, if I was um, R Rafael's general in, in Beijing, I might give uh, President Xi different advice. I might suggest to him, and I know they've got patience, they haven't got to go and take uh, Taiwan now. But I think now is a good time for them to do it. I think, you know, we've, we've seen the Western weakness. We've seen the failure of, of U.S. leadership. And I, I'm not supposed to criticize President Biden, but we've, we've seen that. And I think that this would be a good opportunity for them, if their main concern was whether America would intervene or not. Well, uh, we know that we have Chinese people watching. Don't take this advice. <laughs> 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 Well, I agree with, with Richard in the past. I don't think uh, the war is lost for Putin, at least yet. No? It will depend very much on how we react to the evolving situation in the battlefield. Uh, but again, I think uh, from a prudent military advisor position will be, let's, let's wait until we see a clear military option, which is not, it's not there. No? I think the Russians are, are progressing in the second level of their option, not in the first one, because when they, they send the troops to take uh, the outskirts of Kiev, they fail miserably. Obviously, another, another goal will be just to uh, fragment uh, Ukraine and, 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 and negate to, to Kiev the, the, the exit to the sea. You know? uh, but that's the second goal, not, 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 not the initial one. So I don't, I don't think, uh, but having said that, strategically, I agree also with Richard, this is a very, vulnerable window of opportunity because the Americans are not so credible, the alliance are not there yet, the Japan is not fully enforced, it will be in 10 years time from now. So that will be logically the window of opportunity. But since the military capabilities are problematic at least, I will wait. We're drawing near to the end of the program and I'd like to have one last topic uh, to focus on, uh, considering the fact that the Islamic Republic of Iran is at the cusp, if not already there, with regard to accumulating enough fissile material uh, for at least uh, two nuclear bombs. Uh, General Nauman, we'll start with you. To what degree is this something Europe, which does have two installations, NATO installations, one in Romania, the other one in Poland, uh, surface-to-air systems in order to intercept potential uh, adverse attack from Iran. Is this something that uh, Europe can rely on uh, as a continent, considering the fact that every nation-state, of course, has its own interests? I would take a slightly wider angle on that. Should Iran become a nuclear power, it is uh, a country which is not sanctionable any longer. And then uh, it could continue by using terrorism and other instruments to uh, impress his will on others. And that will create a serious problem for Europe and for the world. Uh, since Iran's aspirations were never limited to Europe or the Middle East uh, as such. You may remember the uh, uh, terrorist attack in Buenos Aires, which uh, went back to Iranian uh, sources. So I think we would have a serious problem at our hands since uh, Europe has to take one thing really into account. The Middle East, the wider Middle East, is Europe's security periphery. We cannot simply turn a blind eye to it. We have to find a way how we can cope with this new issue. And uh, that, I think, is something which is at least as important as uh, uh, the solution of the Ukraine crisis. Dr. Badaki? Well, I, I will be very concerned if the Iranians become nuclear, because becoming nuclear will be having one bomb, two bombs, three bombs, six bombs. In the very beginning, the decision making for a nuclear policy is not there. Second, they will be under the constant threat of being attacked by, by the Israelis or others in order to dismantle the, the nuclear, the small nuclear arsenal. So they will be very trigger happy finger, and that will create dynamics of very instability in the region. No? That, that's my, my, my concern in the short term. It's not an, another nuclear power in the world. It will come and will destabilize the whole region, no? just for being nuclear. Colonel Kemp, North Korea in the Middle East. Is this a clear analogy? I think, I think it's probably more serious than North Korea. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, in terms of 
nuclear use, North Korea will be constrained by China. I don't think China sees it as in its interest to allow North Korea to use a nuclear weapon, but I'm not sure the same would apply to Iran. And I don't, I don't see the threat from Iran nuclear at, at this stage anyway as being towards Europe. I think the threat is very firmly in the Middle East. Um, and, and yet, you know, what, what we've seen uh, at a time when uh, we are under threat from nuclear weapons from Russia, potentially, we've seen uh, our, you know, our gov American governments, European governments, actually facilitate Iran's nuclear weapon and the facilitation led by a Russian, even while we're supposed to be sanctioning Russia. And it's, 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 I think this has exacerbated what was already a very dangerous situation. Mr. O'Sullivan? Could I have a one second point on the last topic and say simply, we don't know how the war in Ukraine is going to end, but we do know something, which is we are not as frightened about Russians as we were before the conflict started. Now, on this, it seems to me, um, unless the Israelis very generously solve the Iranian problem for us, as they did with the Iraqi nuclear reactor, um, I don't think there is the appetite in the West to really take strong action, which means that we are committing ourselves, even whether we know it or not, to a cold war for a long time, uh, containing Iran, responding in various specific ways, to specific, not pacific, to its terrorism and other things, and waiting out the uh, energy and the belief of the Iranian revolution until it gradually fritters away into the sand, as happened with the Soviet Union. Of course, uh, the strike on Osirak in 1982 was uh, uh, nothing uh, in comparison yeah. to uh, Iran's current spread out of its nuclear installations, which ultimately makes any attack on such a nuclear installation uh, a wider Middle East war, which would then spread elsewhere since the uh, Chinese just invested roughly $400 billion in, in uh, Iran. Do you see this as something, uh, General Nauman, one sentence, is this something uh, we can see drive the whole uh, world into more than just strategic competition? Well, I think we, our entire debate uh, indicated that we are really the threshold. We have to define a new security order for Europe and for the West. Uh, this co consists of many components, military is but one. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Mr. O'Sullivan, Colonel okay. Kemp, Dr. Barraki, and General Nauman for being part of today's program. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.